Welcome to our online service. We are so thankful that you're joining with us today to worship King Jesus with us together. He is so worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration. We're thrilled to be starting a two-week sermon series from the book of Nahum this week. We actually chatted as pastors about when the last time was that we'd actually heard a sermon from Nahum, and I had to confess that I couldn't remember the last time I had heard even a verse referenced from Nahum, let alone a whole sermon or a two-week book study. So I'm excited to hear the insights that Pastor Jory will bring today, and then Pastor Matt will bring next week. As we transition into singing a few songs, I just pray that you would join with me now as we we pray for our service and then as we continue to pray for our church family as well. For those especially who have felt disconnected in this past season, that God would bring a name to each of our hearts and our minds that we could pray a blessing over. Someone we could initiate a call or a text to in order to speak words of life and blessing over today and then in the days ahead. So let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that we get to gather again today in your name, Jesus. We're thankful that we have this opportunity to boldly approach the throne of grace because of the shed blood of Jesus. I just pray a blessing on our time together. Pray that as we position our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth, we're thankful that your spirit will be there speaking back words of life over us. And in that same vein, God, I just pray that we would have a picture come to our mind of someone who just needs someone to reach out to them, to show love and to bring words of affirmation and life and blessing. And that, God, we would take that step. We would initiate a call or a text to someone if to say nothing else, we love you and we miss you. And God, I pray that this season ahead, as we're allowed to gather together in greater numbers, that Lord, that there would just be an increasing sense of family and togetherness that would come. And it would come in part because we're willing to step out as individuals and take our part, God, to take our prompts from you, just to be ones who initiate and connect, God. I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I stand amazed in the prayer. Of Jesus the Nazarene and what
singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall live. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
Just a few quick announcements we want to make sure that you are aware of before we transition into today's message. 
we'll be partaking of communion together during the message this morning. So if you can please get some juice or bread or whatever you have with you that you can use as emblems, uh, please do that so you can participate when that time of the service comes. Well, we're glad to announce that we're back for live in-person services on Sunday mornings. And we love seeing your faces again and being together with you. You know, we've missed you. And we're thrilled as well, though, to announce that as of this weekend, we've introduced a third in-person service at the church beginning at 8.30 a.m. So we now have three live in-person services from which you can choose to attend. There's one at 8.30 a.m., one at 10 a.m., and one at 11.30 a.m. And each service has live worship, preaching, and children's ministry. And of course, there's serving opportunities where you can get involved in our weekend services in important areas of ministry, such as greeting, ushering, cleaning, and even children's ministry. You know, your involvement is needed and it's appreciated. And we can grow our church as each of us finds our place and does our part in love. So please feel free to talk to any one of us as pastors or call into the church office. We'd love to point you in the right direction and give you an opportunity to serve and be a blessing to our church family and our guests who attend. You know, our desire is to see each of our three services filled to our 150 person capacity, even through the summer. And you can help us make that happen. So make sure you register early if you want a seat for you and or your family. And consider bringing a friend with you when you come. And please be on time, as we still do need to follow appropriate cleaning protocols between services. And if something comes up and you need to cancel your registration, please cancel well enough in advance to give others who would like to take in a service the opportunity to register. Our church pastoral team and leadership team want to extend a huge thank you to our church family for your faithful giving and even for making adjustment to online and automated giving. It's been a blessing for our financial team. You know, we encourage you to keep giving to the mission of our church in this way. But there are other meanings as well that we want you to be aware of as you consider giving to the ministry of our church. When you come for in-person services or throughout the week, you know, there's offering envelopes that are available for you to use if you still prefer to give by cash or by check. You know, they can be dropped off at the reception desk before and after the services. You know, giving can be done online through our website via e-transfer, even by text to give. So take a moment to familiarize yourself with these options and choose an option that best serves your giving patterns. You know, you can find each of these options at reginaapp.com slash give. And for our last announcement, there are a couple of prayer meetings taking place here at the church during the week on Tuesdays from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. and then on Sundays at 6 to 8 p.m. So please consider attending one of these prayer times and participating in them because we'd love to see more of you come out and pray for a move of the Holy Spirit in our church and throughout our city. Well, that's it for the announcements. Pastor Jory is coming now with today's message. We hope you enjoy what she has to share from God's Word. God bless. For the next two weeks, we're going to look at the book of Nahum. And I've had some mixed reactions, ranging from people being surprised to not really realizing that there's a book in the Bible called Nahum, and to others just commenting on the fact that they can't remember when the last time they've heard a message from the book of Nahum. And maybe that's because the th main theme of Nam isn't going to win a popularity contest. It isn't one of those warm, fuzzy, blanket type of messages. In fact, the message of Nahum is a message about God's judgment. And, and it may actually make us a little uncomfortable. But it's important to know all that is revealed about our God, who is a God who is both stern and kind to his children, a God who judges and who saves. We can also make you know, the mistake of saying, well, that's just the Old Testament. It doesn't necessarily apply or have the same application for my life today. But I want to remind you of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16. He said, all scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable for our teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And when Paul wrote that, 
he was referring to the Old Testament, which Nahum is a part of. You know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same character of God that's revealed in the Old Testament, well, we see the same revealed in the life of Jesus. You know, we see the kindness and the sternness when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem while he warns them of the judgment that's to come. You know, we see his anger at the hypocrisy of the Pharisees as well as we see his compassion when he heals. And as we examine Nahum, although it focuses on the severity of God in judgment, we will also come to understand God's judgment in light of his kindness and in light of his mercy. Nahum 1.1 begins an oracle concerning Nineveh. The word oracle translates in Hebrew as burden, and it's a great way to describe the book of Nahum because that's what it is. It is a burdensome message of of judgment against Nineveh. You know, before we go further into the book, here's just a little bit of history or, or context for you. The Assyrian Empire, and Nineveh was the capital of this empire, was a vast empire. It was like many other empires in history that would invade and occupy other nations. And it was an empire during Nahum's time that wasn't to be messed with. You know, the outrage that had been committed against God's people had been going on for years. And the atrocities committed, they were like many others in human history that were heartless indifferences to human suffering. One author said or compared it with concentration camps of Nazi Germany. That is the type of atrocities that were going on. Nahum prophesied sometime during the time of after 664 BC and before 612 BC. And although we don't specifically know exactly when during the timeline, most agree that it would be shortly before 612 BC. But during this timeline, there's two kings of Judah, and they're vastly different kings. King Manasseh, he was the king that led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. And then came Josiah. And in contrast to his father and his grandfather, it says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in all the ways of David, his father. And although the oracle is against Assyria, it is intended audience is Judah, the people of God. So Nahum continues in verse 2 with, the Lord is. Nahum focuses their attention on who is our Lord, who is God. Let me remind you about your Lord. You know, if this is the only lesson that you take away, and I don't think it will be, but if it's the only lesson, it's a valuable one. When we walk through circumstances, when we face trials and difficult moments, where are we focusing? Where are our eyes? You see, Nam's reminding them to lift up their eyes and look at who is the Lord, not what they're facing. So what does he say? He says, the Lord is a jealous God. You know, that's not usually the first way that we describe God. And yet, it's actually one of the first ways that God reveals himself to his people. This isn't the the same as our jealousy, which is sin. This is actually about loyalty to God. The exclusivity of worship is actually the motivation behind God describing his name as jealous. Exodus 34, 14, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. You know, the best analogy that I could think of would be to compare a, the jealousy that a spouse would have if they found out that their husband or their wife had cheated on them. In fact, we'd probably be concerned if there wasn't some feelings of jealousy. We would question how much that spouse loved their husband or their wife. The Lord is so committed to his people that he is jealous for their complete love and surrender to himself. 
Nahum continues, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrath, wrath, wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. You know, that's not something we often talk about God. But Nam is explaining that the vengeance of God is an expression of his jealous love. God is not jealous of his people, but he is jealous for his people. He is jealous for his people when they are not loyal and they worship other gods. And he's jealous for his people when others would attack them, when people that he had committed to being faithful to, even when they're not. God's not pleased with what the Assyrians are doing to his people. And vengeance affirms God is a God of justice. He will not allow wrongdoing to go unpunished forever. You know, there is nothing vindictive or fickle about God's wrath. It's actually a reaction of his holiness to the sin and evil of the world. God will not allow people to get away with their rebellion and sin forever. Nim continues in verse 3 with more of who the Lord is. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Nam is really saying two things. God will take action against his enemies. He, he can take action and he will. They will not go unpunished. But before that, he's actually linking judgment with God being slow to anger. You see, our God is a patient God, even in the midst of judgment. It doesn't say if Nam knows the story of Jonah's mission to Nineveh, but I think that it's a really safe assumption that he does. Remember the story of Jonah? This is the one that's more familiar to us when it comes to stories about Nineveh. Jonah, about 100 years earlier, he brought a message to the people of Nineveh. And it was a message that demonstrated the characteristic of our God who is slow to anger. Judgment was coming unless they repented. And the people at that time, they responded to the message. And so in Jonah 3.10, it says that when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. God being slow to anger, it's actually an act of grace towards sinners. But it doesn't negate the God will still be just. Yes. Yes, he is full of love and patience and he's merciful and he's kind, but God will judge. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. Although they repented in Jonah's time, Nineveh once again had turned back to their evil ways and God was not going to let it stand. No, we should just take a moment out of the context of Naaman and, and just apply it to us for a moment. Let's remember what Paul said in Romans 3, 10 to 12. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. We have all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, what we deserve, what we've actually earned, is death. And there will come a day of judgment. Listen to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Skipping down to verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There will be a day of judgment. But in between these two verses about judgment, there is verses 8 and 9, and that contains the message of God being slow to anger. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is 
as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The the Lord is slow to anger. He is patient. You know, I may not understand his timing. In fact, it's saying I can't actually understand because his timing is so different than our timing. But what I do know is that we are all benefactors of God's patience. And it's not his desire. It's not his desire that anyone would perish. It is his desire that everyone would, would repent, that everyone would be saved. But he will honor our choice. And just in Nam's day, he honored the choice and he dealt with the, gui- with the guilty. We continue in chapter 1 and we go to verse 4 and it says, The Lord is great in power. You know, Nam paints this verbal picture of the power of God. God created the world and he controls all the elements he has made. Sure, are the Assyrians, do they control much of the ancient Near East? Yes, they are powerful, but God. God, he controls the wind, he controls the clouds, the storms. God controls the water. God's power cannot be matched. Now, remember, what has he done in the past? Well, he made the seas dry up, right? Let's remember the Israelites fleeing from Egypt. He dried up rivers, the people crossing the Jordan. Let's not forget, don't forget how great God's power is. So here's the question, and it's the question that's posed in verse 6. Who can stand? Who can endure God's judgment? No one. You know, for Judah, this is really good news. Nam is saying that their enemies, they cannot escape God's judgment. Yes, the Syrians are powerful, but God in his awesome power, he can stop them. No matter how powerful a nation may become, God still exercises his ultimate sovereignty over them. And this message, although it wasn't good news for Nineveh, it was very good news for Judah, who had endured the oppression of the Assyrian Empire. And that's how Nahum begins in verse 7, the Lord is good. The goodness of God has been made clear and has been declared. In 1 Chronicles 16.34, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love is good endures forever. You know, most of the next verses of chapter one, it's all about how God's goodness is exercised or how we see God's goodness in the midst of his judgment. So the rest of verse seven says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. You know, God has not forgotten his people. Even in the midst of oppression and trials, he never forgets his people. There is absolutely no question that Judah was going through difficult moments, that there were very dark moments that they were facing, and he's declaring he cares for them. He cares for us. The Hebrew word that's translated care for literally means to know in an intimate and personal way. He knows and cares for those who take refuge in him. And his care arises out of his personal and loving and intimate knowledge of them, of you and of me. He knows us, he cares for us, and he loves us. The Lord is good. You know, it goes on and it says, he will complete, completely end his adversaries. We don't like to think about this when we talk about God's goodness. But this is actually part of how God is good to his people. He deals with sin and evil. It's a historic fact that Nineveh did fall. But let's bring this into our lives for a moment. There is evil that is being done in this world, and we should care. We should care when atrocities are being done, and we should be active in not only saying they are not okay, but actually doing something to combat against them. 
You know, Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness, but instead expose them. We also need to remember that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Let's remember who our enemy is. Our enemy, our adversary is the devil, and he seeks to destroy your life, to destroy my life, to destroy all of our lives. But God is good. He deals with our adversaries. Well, what is he prepared for the devil and his angels? Matthew 25, 41 says, eternal fire. And that is where he will be one day forever. The Lord deals with his adversaries. The Lord, he frustrates the plans of the enemy, verses 9 through 11. You know, this wasn't something that was unique. In fact, this was one of the ways that God had previously dealt with others. Remember, there's a story about King David, and he found himself in a situation where his son Absalom, in his rebellion, was actually trying to take over the throne. And Absalom, he got advice from this trusted advisor who was not loyal to David, and, and he gave advice to him that would work. We're not told why, but he actually went and got another set of advice from a different advisor. But this advisor was actually loyal to David. And Absalom chose to take his advice, and he was then defeated and killed. But scripture says this about this moment. It says that Lord, the Lord had ordained to defeat the good counsel, the counsel that would work. In God's goodness, the Lord frustrated the plans and brought defeat. You know, we can find ourselves in situations where it seems that there's difficulties everywhere. Maybe we feel attacked in many ways, but can we heed Nahum's reminder of God's sovereignty? I'm not saying that everything that happens is brought about by God. But what I am reminding us of is this, that for those who love God, all things, all things will work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The Lord is good. He disciplines. Thus says the Lord, though they are Full, they are at full strength and many. They will be cut down and pass away. Though I've afflicted you, I'll afflict you no more. This is verse 12. The Lord is not unaware of what has come because of the sinfulness of his people. But his people, they are reassured that although it has been allowed because of their sin, he will no longer allow it to happen. Remember what I said at the beginning about the two kings of Judah during this time period? You know, the first king, right, he had allowed more evil than the nations that had been destroyed. But then Josiah came, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he led the people back to following God's precepts and ways. God was using the circumstances to bring discipline and repentance. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 teaches us the Lord disciplines those he loves. In fact, it says that if we're not disciplined by God, then we are illegitimate children. Verse 10 continues and, and says that he disciplines us actually for our own good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God's discipline is done in love, and it's not fun, but it will come to an end. And if we allow it, if we choose to, it'll result in fruits, the, in fruit in our lives. I think it's important before we go any further, though, to, to just mention a warning in regards to our understanding of judgment. Because we can be quick to say something or pronounce something as God's judgment, and that should never be our response. You know, this happens in Luke chapter 13, and there's a tower that had fallen and killed 18 Galileans. Jesus asks, do you think that those 18 that died were worse sinners than others because they perished that way? 
And Jesus, he makes it clear the answer is no. They were no worse than those that were not killed that way. You see, Jesus in this moment, instead of focusing on uh, what possibly could have caused it, he's, he's using this as a teachable moment. And he's saying to these people, he's saying, you know, what really matters is that if you don't repent, you will perish. You see, the lesson is that we are to focus on our own heart, to examine ourselves, because we, you and I, we will give an account for our own life. Nam continues in verse 13, and it says, And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. The Lord, he is good. He delivers and he sets free. You know, this wasn't the first time that God delivered his people. Remember the Passover where the Hebrews were set free and delivered out of Egypt? Yes, God, God set them free from the oppression of the Egyptian by using the slaying of a lamb. But that moment served in an even more important way to point us towards Jesus, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God promises to burst the bonds apart. Yes, there is freedom in this current moment. Nam is saying you will soon be free from your oppressors. But let it also point us beyond to freedom from sin through Jesus. Remember, it was Jesus, he taught us that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. But this is the good news. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You know, this is the greatest freedom, freedom from slavery to sin. And that freedom, that freedom has actually been made available through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we're going to take this moment right now, and I want to invite you to just take your emblems, your cracker and your juice, and we're going to pause and we're going to remember what the Lord has done. We're going to partake in the Lord's table together, and we're going to remind ourselves of the cost of our freedom, and we're going to celebrate that together and just express our thanks to God for it. So I'll just invite you to take the cracker. And it says, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he, gave, when, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take this cracker together and let's remember his broken body that was done for our freedom from sin. Thank you, Jesus. We just pause and we just say thank you. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for the cross. And then on the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take this cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just thank you so much for your blood. We thank you that you died for our freedom from sin, that you set us free from the bondage of sin. We praise you today. We're almost finished chapter one. There is one verse left, Nahum 1, verse 13. And Nahum says, let's rejoice. This is good news. God's justice will be done, and you're going to be set free. He continues and says, Judah, keep your feasts. And although we don't really know which ones he's referring to, what we do know is that he's calling them to celebrate what God has done together. And then he ends with a challenge to each person individually to fulfill their own vows, to keep their own vows. So let's end the same way today. Let's celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ, that we have freedom, that we have freedom from bondage and sin. And that when we gather together with hearts full of thanksgiving, let's choose to be thankful for what the Lord has done for us. Let's choose to rejoice together. And lastly, let's just remember that each of us 
have our own relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a vow that we've made to follow Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. And if you haven't yet made that commitment, well, today is the day. Turn your life over to him. Invite him into your life. You know, God may also be speaking to you or reminding you of some specific things that he's called you to, promises or vows that you're currently not living up to. And it's never too late. Maybe you made a commitment to God as a young child or you made a promise even last week and you've walked away from it. Or maybe there was a promise that was too difficult to keep and, or you just thought it was too difficult. I want to encourage you to make it right with him today and fulfill the vows that you've made. And remember, can I just encourage you today, remember Regardless of what you're facing, of what you're walking through, keep your focus on who God is. Let me just pray with you as we end to close. God, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that you are the God that judges and you are the God that saves. I thank you for your sternness and your kindness. And God, I thank you that we are all benefactors of your patience. And God, right now I pray that for everyone that hears this message, Lord God, that they would choose, Lord God, to turn their lives over to you, that they would repent and walk away from their sin and give their lives over to you, Jesus. We celebrate you today. We thank you, Lord. We rejoice in all that you've done and who that you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, thanks again for watching. We trust you were encouraged, inspired, and maybe even a bit challenged by the message this week. Why not take a moment, even right now, and share this video with someone you know, or post it on your Facebook page. Give someone else an opportunity to experience what you have today. Well, we'd love for you to stay connected with our Sunday gatherings, either in person or online. For service times and registration, as well as information about our children's and youth programs and upcoming events at the church, visit us at reginaapp.com. If you're looking to connect into a small group to get involved in the life of our church in any way, we'd love to help you find a spot that fits you best. Pastor Llewellyn would love to work with you to get you connected. Just send a quick email to getconnected at reginaapp.com. So thanks again for watching, and be a friend to someone this week. Reach out with a text or make a call. Your voice may be just what's needed to brighten someone's day. God bless, and have a great week. Thank you.